Well, good morning, North Haven. Welcome to this live stream service that uh, we have yet again this Sunday. Uh, what a fantastic, uh, beautiful day that this is. It's been a great weekend weather-wise, and uh, uh, I hope that you and your family are safe uh, and that you are blessed and encouraged today. What a tremendous time of worship as well. I'm so thankful uh, that we have uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, men and women who are committed to give God the best of what he has given them. And we have uh, musicians and vocalists uh, in part of our worship ministry here that not only are incredibly gifted, but have such a passion and desire uh, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And we couldn't be more blessed well, I, um, I, for those of you who may not know who I am, my name is Adam Sidler. I'm the senior pastor here at North Haven. And uh, again, thank you for joining us uh, for this live stream. Now, before I jump into the message here this morning, there's a couple things I want to uh, mention and kind of bring to our attention uh, here. Uh, so the first is this. Um, we are, uh, as Alex was saying earlier, we're definitely in unprecedented times. And because of that, it's not only difficult to know what to do in the present, it's difficult to know what to do or what we're going to do in the near future. And so, you know, for a large part of this, we're, we've kind of been playing it by ear, really seeking God's wisdom and guidance in all matters, um, but then focusing on, uh, on it one week at a time. And we may not know what next week is going gonna, is gonna to give us or the week after that, um, but we're remaining diligent to, to not only be uh, good stewards with the resources that we have, but discerning and wise in the decisions that we make. Now, with that being said, you know, one of the questions that I sh I'm sure is, is on your heart and on your mind, as well as it is on mine, is when do we get to uh, back to some semblance of normalcy? And when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about um, our life together as a church, and specifically coming together on Sunday mornings here in this building for our services. And the answer to that question is, I, I don't know. I don't know when that's going to happen, but I do know that it will. And I'm looking forward to that day where we can soon, hopefully soon, be able to, like I said, be in this place. Now, we are together, right? We are the church, and we're doing that via this virtual relationship. But that is nothing compared to actually being in this space together here this morning um, and any other Sunday morning. And so we look forward to that. And when that's going to happen is, is to be... Um, it's really unseen. It, it, it is yet to be determined. But when we do, when we are back together here in this place, we are committed right now to doing ministry the way that we've been doing it. And specifically, I just want to say this, specifically in regards to our distinct services. Uh, so we've been going through this live stream endeavor, uh, doing one service at 10 a.m., but uh, lest you forget, we do have two services when we are in our normalcy, 9 and 10. 30. Our 9 o'clock service is our classic service, and our 1030 service is our modern service. And, you know, we're trying to kind of bridge that gap over this live stream period, but when we get into that normalcy, we're committed to having that distinct approach to our worship. Uh, uh, so I want to just encourage you with that, um, and also just encourage you to continue to pray that God would intervene in this time and that not only for the sake of the church, but for the sake of all things, whether it's employment, whether it's you know, the economy, uh, certainly people's health, uh, the political climate, all of these aspects that are being drastically affected by this virus, we know that God can and does overcome. And so just want to continue to uh, encourage you to pray and to put God first, not only in your life, but certainly in this whole situation. So with that being said, let's, let's jump into this message. Now, last week, if you joined us for the service, uh, we ventured into um, a two-week series. So kind of this, this short uh, uh, 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for, just smaller series. Typically, we do a four to five week time span, but two weeks, we're committed to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, but specifically, we are looking at how Psalm 23 has within it, embedded within it, 10 Easter eggs, we're calling it. Now, if you don't know what an Easter egg is and you aren't familiar with what we talked about last week, yes, Easter eggs are those things that, that uh, kids scour the yards for at Easter time. But specifically in this context, an Easter egg in pop culture is one where, where something the creator puts into, whether it's the, a movie, whether it's a TV show, or a painting, or a story, and it's something that gives reference to something else and that if you are a fan of that thing you can notice it and be excited about it claim that you've seen it or whatever the case may be one of the easter eggs i mentioned last week is in the movie raiders of the lost ark now, there are many of us who are fans of that movie, Harrison Ford, back in the 80s, right? Now, Raiders of the Lost Ark, when he's down in the, the tomb getting the ark, there's hieroglyphics all around him. And one of the pictures, one of the hieroglyphics, is that of C-3PO and R2-D2. Now, that's not to say that Star Wars is in the same cinematic universe as Raiders of the Lost Ark. But the creators of Star Wars were also making Raiders of the Last Ark and put in that little Easter egg. And so if you are a fan, you see that, you notice it, and you're like, oh, cool, that's an Easter egg. And we're looking now at Psalm 23 and how God has embedded within Psalm 23 10 Easter eggs that point to Jesus Christ. Now, when I say that, I'm saying we're looking specifically at 10 names of Jesus that also point to 10 characteristics. Now, before we dive into that further, we're going to look back at Psalm 23. We're going to read that psalm in its entirety. Now, lest you be concerned about the length of that, it's a relatively short psalm, and it's one that I'm sure you probably probably heard of before. Even, even if you don't open up your Bible very often or maybe don't consider yourself a churchgoer, chances are you have at some point heard some aspects of this psalm. So let's read this together. It's going to be on the screen there for you. So Psalm 23, this is what it says. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever." Psalm 23. Now, as I mentioned, we ventured into this psalm in kind of breaking it down last week. And in last week, we looked at the first five names of Jesus that is embodied here in this chapter. And today, we're going to look at the last five and the next five. Now, but within this chapter, like I said, are these ten names of Jesus, these ten names of God. And that name is embodied in Jehovah. We we looked at the word Jehovah and Yahweh and how these are two English translations of an ancient Hebrew word that was given to God, also known as Lord. We see that there at the very beginning. The Lord is my shepherd, Jehovah Yahweh. Now this name, Jehovah, is the name that is above every name. We talked about last week how this name, because Yahweh specifically, we don't know actually how ancient Hebrews pronounced that name. And the reason for that is because they wouldn't actually utter it. There was superstition behind that, and so they would instead change that word to God or Lord because they believed that that name shouldn't actually be said out loud. Now, that name, God, Lord, and in this case, Jehovah, is the name that is above every name, 
And also this name belongs to Jesus, the Son of God. So actually, God attributed that name, the name that is above every name, the name Jehovah, to Jesus. We see that specifically in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, where it says, Therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Jesus being the Son of God, Jesus being, yes, 100% human and 100% God, God incarnate, Jesus, the name that is above every name, Jehovah. Now, furthermore, Psalm 23 gives us not only a glimpse of, of, of Jesus, but also a glimpse of him as our shepherd, our good shepherd, the chief shepherd, the Bible says. And then specifically, as I mentioned, the, there are those 10 names of Jesus that then speak to 10 characteristics that Jesus possesses. And all of this ultimately helps us then understand more completely who Jesus is and how he interacts with us in our daily lives. And in this day, it's specifically, maybe even more so, important to embrace these characteristics and to claim them as our own, as he's wanting us to do. Now, one thing I want to mention here before we jump into these names. Now, you are obviously watching this via live stream, and I don't know whether you are aware, but one of the things that you can do, it's very simple, is to share this live feed. It's not going to take you out of the feed. It's basically just going to send it out onto your timeline, and it's going to encourage other people to see it as well. Now, it, other people, they may latch on and they may watch for its duration or they may check it out and maybe not check it out until next week. But it, what an easy and great way for you to be able to just get the word out. Hey, this is North Haven. This is my church or this is the church that I've been watching. Check this out. And one of the biggest reasons why this is important is because today we're not only going to be looking at these 10 names and thus the 10 characteristics that these names imply, but we're also going to speak to a fundamental, important, and life-changing truth that changes lives. And there are many out there who desperately need to hear the hope that is Jesus Christ. So get the word out, share this live stream, and maybe we can uh, get some other people tuned in as we continue in our time. So as I mentioned last week, we ventured into this, this uh, series, um, uh, Easter Eggs, and we looked at the first five names. And what I want to do now is I just want to kind of recap those first five names. I'm not going to uh, spend as much time last week or today as I did last week, but we're just going to look, refresh our memory as to what these first five names were. Remember, we broke down the passage verse by verse, and we started with verse 1, where it says, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And how specifically the name that we see there is Jehovah Ra, which means the Lord my shepherd. The Lord my shepherd. And we looked at how the characteristic of Jesus that's embodied here is that Jesus is dependable. He's dependable. In a world where everything and everyone disappoints, we disappoint and other people disappoint us, circumstances, situations, jobs, finances, our homes, everything kind of fades away and disappoints to some degree, but Jesus is always and forevermore dependable. He never fades, he never diminishes, and he never disappoints. And then we look further into verse 2 where it says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. And that word that we see there is Jehovah Shalom. And that is my, the Lord my peace. And the characteristic that we see in Jesus here is that Jesus is a peace giver. The analogy I gave last week is when we are overcome by waves, Jesus, he comes and he lifts us above those waves. So the waves are hitting him while we reside in safety in his arms. See, Jesus can take the waves. We cannot. So Jesus is the peace giver. And then furthermore, in verse 3, he refreshes my soul. 
The word that we see there is Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Rapha, and that is the Lord my healer. And the characteristic of Jesus that we see here is that Jesus is a healer. That there is nothing that is bigger than Jesus. There is nothing that Jesus cannot overcome. Meaning that he can heal us, yes, physically. He can also heal us emotionally. He can heal us mentally. And yes, he can heal us spiritually. Jesus is the healer. And then in verse 3, further on, he guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. The name that we see there is Jehovah Sidkenu, and that is the Lord of Righteousness. And the characteristic that we see there is that Jesus is just. He is just, not just just dot dot dot, but he is just. We so much want to take justice into our own hands, don't we? But Jesus wants to work in his time and in his way, and he is just. He will forever and always will be just. And then in verse four, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. And this was the last name that we looked at last week. And that word is Jehovah Shema. Jehovah Shema. And the Lord is present. The Lord is present. And the characteristic of Jesus is that Jesus is present. He isn't just a, a thought in the past, and he isn't just a hope for the future. Yes, he is those things, the promise of the past and the hope for the future, but he also is present, meaning that he is involved and invested in our daily lives now. He is concerned with you. He's concerned with this church. He's concerned with this city. He's concerned with the state of Minnesota, the country that is the United States, and the world. He is present now and involved and invested. And we could take comfort in that fact. And so today, we're going to break down now these next five names that speak to who Jesus is, that reveal characteristics about Jesus that are so necessary for us to come to grips with in our daily lives. So let's just go ahead and jump in. So further in verse 4, we see, this, we see this verse, Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, I could go into a whole series and, and outline what it means that Jesus is the good and chief shepherd and how he uses the rod and the staff. That's actually a fascinating exploration that we will invest in in some day. But right now, we're going to look at the name that's implied here, and that is Jehovah Ezer. Jehovah Ezer. And that is the Lord my help. The Lord my help. And this is the name given to denote God's help and safety. And we see that in Proverbs 18, 10. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and they are safe. So what is the characteristic of Jesus that is, that is revealed here? Well, it is simply that Jesus is a helper. Jesus is a helper. You know, in medieval England, uh, there was a, a, an asylum law that was put into place. So basically, it, it worked like this, generally speaking. It varied from area to area and church to church. But basically, the way it worked is when a criminal was on the run from uh, local authorities, they could, they could hightail it to a zone that was marked by markers around a church. And if they got, it was kind of like, like, a, like a, a, a life and death stakes game of tag. If they got past those markers into the church zone, they could claim asylum. And now they were under the protection of the church. Now, as I said, it varied, but it, generally speaking, they had right around 40 days to confess their sins and their guilt. And in doing so, they were then exiled, but they were exiled under the protection of the church. They had to leave either that area or even the, the country. But as I said, they were under that protection. Now, like the medieval church, Jesus also has established himself as a help and a safety for us. But unlike, unlike the medieval church, a person need not exist in this game of cat and mouse in order to reach 
Jesus. And that's the important point here. You see, the very act of running to Jesus, that fortified tower as described here in 23 verse 4, actually produces safety. And we see that, right? Where it says, you're, I'm sorry, you're, you're, uh, the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. So the very act of running to Jesus, the fortified tower, produces safety. In that once you turn to Jesus, once you, the act of repentance is making a 180 switch from where you were going to then going to Jesus. Once you turn to Jesus, you receive his help. You receive his safety. A fortified tower that is strong and cannot be overcome, nor can it be undone. So Jesus is our helper, Jehovah Ezer. The next name that we see is in verse 5, where it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That name there is Jehovah Nisi, and that is the Lord, my standard of victory. The Lord, my standard of victory. That's the name of the altar which Moses erected after the defeat of the Amalekites. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 15, we see this. Moses, he built an altar and he called it, the Lord is my banner. Now he said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, and the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. So what is the characteristic of Jesus that's revealed here? Jesus is victorious. Jesus is victorious. So what? what? Why is that important for us to understand here this morning? Now many of us, including myself, you know, we have t-shirts or clothing or jerseys, uh, memorabilia, signs, or whatever the case may be of our favorite sports teams, right? Now my favorite sports team, I'm a Minnesota boy, so I like all of them here in Minnesota, but the Minnesota Vikings, you know, they're my go-to. So yes, I have the jersey, we, I have a picture hung up in, uh, in, my, in my office of the Vikings uh, Metrodome before it was torn down. Down. You know, I'm a Vikings lifer, right? I bleed purple, okay? And we proclaim victory, right? We, every year, draft season is upon us, so we got done with the draft, and we get excited about our teams, and we think this is the year, and we claim our team is number one, right? We proclaim victory with our teams, but as the saying goes, any given Sunday, right? Now, that doesn't just apply to football, but any other sport, any other team that we root for, they could win just as much as they could lose, right? Now, some teams are, are better than others. They're more equipped, and, and maybe they win more, you know, a.k.a. The, the Patriots, even though that story's probably done now that Brady's in Florida. But, you know, with the Vikings, you know, every Sunday that they play, yes, they could win, but they could also lose, that there's no guarantee. But yet we claim victory. We, we raise that banner high. We say our team is number one until they aren't. But herein lies the problem, right? Any given Sunday, that team that we root for can either win or lose. But when we hold up the banner of Jesus, we can know that he has never and he never will be defeated, that he is always and perpetually victorious. Jesus remains victorious, and he is the standard of victory in that he is victory. He is the embodiment of victory. And so we can raise that banner high and proclaim the victory that is Jesus, knowing that he will never lose because he never has. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my standard of victory. Jesus is victorious. So then further in verse 5, we see yet another name of Jesus in the verse, you anoint my head with oil. And the name that we see there is Jehovah in Kadesh. Jehovah in Kadesh, and the, that is the Lord, my holiness, my sanctification. 
Now, it's the name that God used when he reiterated the command to observe the Sabbath. In Exodus chapter 1, verses 12 through 13, we see, Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, You must observe the Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. What is the characteristic that's revealed here in Jesus? Jesus is holy. He is holy. He is set apart. Why is that that important for us to understand and to really embrace here this morning? You see, Jesus is the gold standard for living in this present age. That he is the gold standard for then also what we aspire to be in the future. Jesus is holy. As the name that is above every name, Jesus, Jehovah, he is exalted and he is worthy of our praise and then some. But Jesus also calls us to be holy. See, not that we are set apart, not that we are almighty, but he calls us to be fully devoted to his nature and to his work. And every day, every day should be a day of sanctification, and that means that it should be a longing pursuit to know him, to know Jesus, and then to make him known. That that should be the heartbeat of our lives, a full devotion to, and worship to Jesus, who is holy, who is set apart, who is almighty, who calls us then to a longing pursuit to know him, to grow in holiness because he is holy. Jehovah in Kadesh, the Lord, my holiness, my Sabbath, my sanctification. And then even further in verse 5, we see yet another name of Jesus, and that's in the verse, my cup overflows, my cup overflows. That name is Jehovah Manna, Jehovah Manna, the Lord my portion. Lamentations 3.24 says, I say to myself, the Lord has my portion, therefore I will wait for him. What is the characteristic of Jesus that's revealed here? Jesus is enough. He's enough. Why is that so important? Our lives are saturated with more. We see that all the time. We can't go anywhere in the day without seeing some semblance of what it means to have more. We see that in billboards, we see that in commercials, we see that in our Facebook feeds. You probably have seen an advertisement or for some sort of thing that you should buy because it, we, we're supposed to have more. We also strive for more in our jobs or in our neighborhoods, you know, keeping up with the Joneses or in our academic pursuits or in our purchases. Now there's nothing wrong with, with having things. There's nothing wrong with you know, trying to achieve a higher education. There's nothing wrong with, with having a nice lawn. All that stuff is fine. The question isn't whether those things are fine, but the question is whether we see Jesus as the ultimate source. Whether we see Jesus ultimately as enough. What would happen if we stopped And we said, Jesus, you are enough. In you, I have everything I need. What if we approached him that way? How much differently would our lives be? Would we truly be satisfied? Well, the Bible tends to believe we would be. Jesus is the source of all we need. And as such... He asks us to live our lives accordingly. Jehovah, manna, the Lord my portion. And then the final name that we look at in Psalm 23, we find that in the, in the, in the, in the sixth verse, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord 
forever. That word is Jehovah Kelech. The Lord, my inheritance. The Lord, my inheritance. In Psalm 16.5 it says, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. What is the characteristic of Jesus that's revealed here? It's simply that Jesus is our inheritance. He is our inheritance. We are guaranteed two things in this life, and only two. Well, not necessarily in this life, but we are guaranteed two things in our being. We will all die, and we will all exist for eternity. So the question remains, will you either exist for eternity in God's presence or apart from him? Because that's what's at stake. Now the only way for us to exist in God's presence was for us to be made right because we are a sinful, fallible, unholy humanity And God is a perfect, holy, almighty, pure God. There could not be a relationship between an almighty, holy God and an unholy, imperfect humanity. And there was nothing we could do to bridge that gap because we're not God. And so God had to bridge that gap for us. And he did that through Jesus Christ who wasn't just some guy who had really great ideas, who had a certain moral compass, who was a motivating, captivating communicator. He was and is the Son of God. God incarnate, Jehovah, the name above every name. God came to earth as Jesus. Why? Because we couldn't go to him. And he provided that way by sacrificing his life on the cross and then three days later raising from the dead in which we celebrated, proclaimed this past Easter. But we still need to do that every day of our lives because it is the resurrection that makes salvation, that makes that right relationship that we so desperately need with God possible. See, when a person confesses their sins and they believe that Jesus is the Son of God and they decide to follow Jesus and make him the leader of of their life, the Bible says that they are saved and they are then guaranteed an eternity in God's presence, in the presence of Jesus. That is our inheritance for those who choose to believe And it's given to you and to me because of Jesus' blood. It is Jesus' blood that now is coursing through our veins. And so if they were to do a blood test on us, right, a spiritual blood test, we we would be fine to have the same now DNA that God has in that we are his children. We are his children because the blood of Jesus runs through our veins. We are his. Jesus is our inheritance. He is our hope. He is our life. He is our promise. So the questions here today remain, are are you willing to live your life recognizing that Jesus is a helper? Jehovah Ezer, the Lord my help. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my standard for victory, will will you go through your life proclaiming and knowing that Jesus is victorious? That whether he wins or loses isn't up for grabs. No, he has won. And he will forever remain victorious. 
Jehovah in Kadesh, the Lord, my holiness, my sanctification. Will you embrace the fact that Jesus is holy, that he is set apart, that he is almighty, and that he causes us to a life of holiness, this constant pursuit of knowing him and making him known. Jehovah manna, the Lord, my portion. Will you acknowledge that Jesus is enough, that he is the ultimate source for all things? And Jehovah, Kelech, the Lord, my inheritance. Will you live your life knowing that Jesus is our inheritance? He is our hope. He is our promise of an eternity with him. See, these aren't aren't just nice thoughts and anecdotes found in Psalm 23. We are seeing the true nature of who Jesus is. And it's revealed so beautifully within that psalm. There's a story of a young, young boy who was going with his grandfather to an old well. And when they got to the well, the little boy sees this, this bucket that's lying on the ground. And it looks old. It looks useless because he can see... He could see there in the bucket that there are gaps between the slats. He could see sunlight going through the slats of the bucket. And he, he deduces that that bucket clearly can't hold any water. But his grandfather reaches down to the bucket and he lifts it up and he, he puts it in the well and lowers it into the well. And, and there it sits for a while until after a certain amount of time, the grandfather pulls the bucket back up, and here the young boy sees this bucket that once seemed so porous, so dry, and and so unable to hold water. Now the water inside that well has rehydrated it so that the wood closed up and was able to hold the water that they needed. That's what the Word of God does for us. You know, the Bible has become, for some of us, an old wooden well bucket. But when the Bible is rehydrated with the message of God's love through Jesus... When we look at God's word and understand that it is God's love letter to you and to me, the Bible then begins to hold a richness and a beauty that changes lives. It interacts with us. It isn't static. Rather, it engages with us and it forces us to to look at our own lives and how it is that we approach God and we approach others. And it guides and it leads and it inspires. That is why it's so important for us to not get complacent with the treasure and the beauty that is the word of God because it is rich and it is beautiful. And it is life changing. Because within those words are a message, is a message that changes you and me. The message of Jesus. A love that was so perfect and so profound profound, that it cost the life of his son, of God's son, Jesus Christ. So that Jesus could provide the way by defeating death so that you and I could have that relationship with him. If that's something that you are interested to know more about, I want to talk to you. I would love to explore with you what the message of Jesus means for you. If you have any questions about that, if you would like to to talk with me or one of the other pastors here at North Haven, we would love to explore that with you. And there's several ways that you can reach out. You can can Facebook message the church. 
and we'll get back to you as soon as possible in regards to having a conversation and praying with you, knowing how we can walk with you in this journey of finding and following Jesus. Or you can email me at adam at northhavenchurch.org. Real simple, adam at northhavenchurch.org. And again, it would be my privilege to not only know how I can pray for you, but to help you see even more fully the love of God so perfectly and beautifully embodied in his son, Jesus Christ. North Haven, thank you so much for joining us here today for this opportunity that we've had yet again to share in this service, to celebrate the good news, to be encouraged, to worship God, to know him and to make him known. I hope that today is a fulfilling and, and rich day that you can find rest, that you can, that you can work and find pleasure in your work, that you would be encouraged by the presence of God, and that you would seek him and seek how he wants to use you. Thank you again. We love you, and we can't wait to do this with you here in this place. But until then, God bless, and we'll see you next time.